Thank you so much for coming. Um, I was watching a short film on Phila de Barlow um, last week, and she talks about the importance of chance in her work. And so today I'm going to do my introduction without any notes. This could go horribly wrong. But just to say thank you so much for coming, and welcome to the Inside Out lecture series here in the School of Art, Architecture, and Design at Leeds Beckett University. Uh, the mission of our lecture series, the Inside Out lecture series, is to bring the most prestigious minds, the best minds of our generation to Leeds Beckett um, to share their work with students and staff um, and, and inspire us. And uh, today I think we really have surpassed ourselves um, with Phila de Barlow, one of the world's leading sculptors, and Louisa Buck um, in conversation. Um, a real treat. But to do a proper formal introduction, um, we have got, of course, Godfrey Worsdale, um, the director of the Henry Moore Foundation. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Simon. And that actually was an entirely adequate introduction to this afternoon, so I could sit down. But I will just say um, a little bit about the context um, to today. Um, some of you may know uh, this year we're embarking on the, the pilot um, version of the Yorkshire Sculpture International project, which really capitalizes on the vast wealth that this part of the world has um, and has historically invested in the subject of sculpture. So, as you'll all know very well, the Henry Moore Institute, Leeds Art Gallery and its sensational collections of sculpture, the Hepworth Wakefield and the Yorkshire Sculpture Park are a remarkable concentration of interest in this field, uh, the like of which you won't find anywhere in the world. Um, and Combining efforts under the Yorkshire Sculpture Triangle banner in recent years has led on to a discussion that perhaps we can, we can make uh, progress on that. And the collective decided to develop a festival that will not only demonstrate the wealth that we have in this region, but also will ensure that it connects with people involved in sculptural practice across the globe. Um, and so it felt like an idea and we started in earnest. But one of the things we were nervous about in that process was the way that we would define the project. We didn't want to pilot in uh, an Uber curator from somewhere else in the world who may not have the depth of knowledge of this part of the world and what we do here and what we've done for so long. Um, but we did feel we needed an external agent to challenge us in some way or find a way of pulling us in a particular direction that could really ensure we work effectively together. And this was some, someone that would really need to be in a position to understand us as organisations but fundamentally to grasp our subject. And doing things by committee is fatally dangerous as you all know. But we did retreat to our corners and agree to identify each of us two or three people who we felt could really take this challenge on and provoke us in a way that would, would make this whole project work. And I, I s just sat down and thought, this is going to be one of those awful, awful moments because we're going to end up with eight different names and everyone will champion their favourite. But to cut a long story short, when we all came back into the room a few weeks later, one person was on every single list and the problem of negotiation just went away. And that one person was Philip Barlow. Um, now, this is not simply because of Philida's work, although that's clearly central to our thinking, but the relationships over the years that Philida's had with each of our institutions in one form or another and to the debate around sculpture. And, and we're very grateful that in, on top of a hugely um, busy schedule and even a few minutes of, of looking above our heads will, will illustrate the... Uh, incredible amount of work that Philida has undertaken in recent years. But nevertheless, in true style, in your very, very ge generous uh, approach, Philida, you were, you were able to provoke us in a wonderful way. Um, and there'll be more to hear about that with the Yorkshire Sculpture International project that begins in June this year. Um, now, the other thing to say about the project is that we are supported by Arts Council England, we're supported by Wakefield and Leeds City, um, and we're also supported by the two great universities in Leeds who have really understood the central role of academic research and <coughs> endeavour in and alongside our project. Um, so I'm delighted that, to have those institutions as partners and particularly delighted that one of the outcomes of that partnering is this series of lectures and talks <laughs> of which this is the first of five 
So it's great to see you all here, but please get in your diaries the subsequent four um, events. Now, um, I would like to welcome you both. Thank you very much for coming to Leeds today. Louisa Buck is a, an unusual character in the art world, if you don't mind me saying so. Um, uh, um, the contemporary art correspondent for the art newspaper and a great, great art critic and a person who understands art so very, very fully, which is not always the case in people who write about it, but with Louisa it absolutely is. But interesting, Louisa is as likely to be found writing extremely knowledgeably about the the commercial art world, the art marketers, uh, but then at the next minute being invited by the Arts Council to, to help them understand the, the public sector. And so to have that breadth is, is, is enviable, but also to have someone with sensitivity to art on top of that is fantastic. And Phyllida Barlow, um, well, the images say a lot about her, and I know that Louisa's questioning will reveal more, but suffice to say that it's a, it's a huge honour, Phyllida, to have you here. And... Um, it's great to have your involvement in the, in the international, and we're delighted to see you. So a, a warm welcome, please, for our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Godfrey. Well, I'm going to kick off, first of all, because Godfrey welcomed, um, mentioned the words provocation and provocateur, and Philida is the provocateur, the overarching kind of gauntlet thrower down for, for, for Yorkshire Sculpture International, and this, this sense of dealing with provocations. And in fact, what, what he didn't reveal, I'm going to give a little bit more detail, is, is that the, in, in the discussions between the institutions um, com comprising the Sculpture International, um, Philida was invited um, to, to, to lay down, to be a provocateur, and actually to lay down a series of provocations, of which there are nearly 70 of them. The, the overarching theme for the Sculpture International is the, is the sense that sculpture is the most anthropological of the art forms, and we're going to discuss that in a minute. But I'm curious, Philida, that your first provocation that you laid down in this comprehensive list that you gave both to the, the, the arose to the organizers and indeed to the participating artists is it is pointless to define what sculpture is hmm. and I'd like you to discuss that a bit more because we are here seeing your amazing very physically present extraordinarily encompassing sculptures rolling along here you are very much a sculptor but you're saying it's imp it's impossible to define what sculpture is and i want you to point this rather to define what sculpture is now you've also said you don't necessarily agree with these provocations so i'm <laughs> curious to jump in with your with your first gauntlet as to what exactly do you mean by it's pointless to define what sculpture is or is it pointless to define what sculpture is i, I think it is pointless because i think during the last century and long before, sculpture has in itself dissolved itself in the face of such things as the pictorial. I think of Bernini as a great painter. He just happens to do it with marble <laughs> and all sorts of other materials like that. I think... When you say in your provocation here, Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa is film and not sculpture. So... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Sculpture has, is itself a problematic word. I don't know how to define it as a word. But if, if I think of sculpture as a language, then I feel much more comfortable with the notion that we're dealing with a sentient art form that sometimes can be as much about smell and temperature as it is about materiality and objecthood. And therefore, the lure of a sculptural language is going to take you into a range of mediums that transcend far beyond bronze, marble, wood, and the object itself. And of course, that's what I'm passionate about. It's the, the sentient human being meeting the sentient qualities of stuff, and that these things are kind of unhinged from their usual way of behaving and given this new status wherever they might be. And I, I find that an incredibly important aspect. So we get video as sculpture. We get installations that are dealing with liquids and fluids and smells and temperatures that are sculpture. It's a restless medium. It won't lie down and be accounted for. And that's why I think it's so incredibly powerful. 
And this notion of anthropology also crops up. I mean, it's your it's the overarching prov provocation statement mm. for the for the for the sculpture international that's going to be unfolding. But I think what you just said about the sentient human being actually engaging with all our senses mm -hmm. and engaging with all our forms seems to very much play out in the sense of the anthropological aspect of your sculpture and also the sense of the audience. Of course, every artist wants to make their audience respond to their work, but you see that you see the, the audience as actually one of the protagonists when the work is installed. You don't think about the audience when you're making the work or no. conceiving the work, mm. but when it's mm. installed, the audience becomes an active protagonist. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that, about why you see that and how you see that manifesting. Well, I think so. when I'm making the work, it's impossible to think of who's going to look it, uh, at it other than myself. It's a very self-centered, in every meaning of that word, activity. And the audience is like a hideous distraction. You know? <laughs> it's, uh, it's sort of a dread at the back of my mind, you know, and so that just doesn't exist. And also my making of the work involves assistants, one of whom's sitting in the front row there, and um, therefore it's very much a collaboration at that point. There's, there's so much going on that is, in a way, quite connected to theatricality and performance at that point. You know, the demonstrating of how I want the work to be is often fastidious and very demanding on assistants. You know, they sometimes have to re-wake, remake works in their entirety because it hasn't gone right. So there's a lot of trial and error and a lot of ways of working with a team of people. With the smaller works, of course, they are all made by me. Mm. And um, so that's my time of great intimacy. But when the work arrives in a venue, then the shock really does happen. And the first thing I feel is, who on earth made this stuff? You know, it's, it's like being given a script for a play that you've no idea what the play is or you've never seen the script before I've never seen the script before so there's a lot of sort of um, at that moment it's it's very dramatic that encounter with this work that takes on a completely new status once it's in the space so that's the second sort of realization about the work and also the the next one is what is the space, you know, how the space and the works relate to each other. Does one devour or overwhelm the other? Does the space win or does the space lose or is it a mutual collaboration? And then the final one is when the audience enters, which for me is the most important moment when the whole trio of activities come together. And the, my ideal is that the audience is kind of maneuvered around. So there is a shared performance between audience, the work, and the space. There's so much here that I want to zero into, but I'm going to just zero into the actual space aspect because you do talk about space so frequently as being another of these protagonists. And of mm. course, each different space I'm thinking of it dictates different terms in your mind. I mean, it's interesting that the work is, ma is made specifically for spaces. I'm thinking, we'll, we'll go to the Venice Biennale, which mm. I'm sure many people in the audience did, did visit, which you, know, you responded to that space conceptually and physically, this British space, mm. this authority, this, this voice of the nation at the time of the, the, the stirrings of Brexit, well, more, more stirrings of Brexit at that point than, yes. than, than now. Yeah. Um, so therefore, that, that laid down a particular kind of set of, set of imparameters. But then other spaces, spaces like the Duvines, which is more processional mm. about movement, other other kinds of considerations. Mm. And of course, at the moment, the Royal Academy space is, which you, the work of the, the series is wonderfully called cul-de-sac, because it does actually end. Another set of spaces, mm. processional, but it ends. Could you talk a little bit about the kind of, the ways in which these spaces, both conceptually and physically, dictate how you move your audience around, yeah. or how you want the audience to, to experience just, just the work? Just um, one thing. I. I've never known what the word conceptual means, so anyone mm. who can help me with that. Well, I meant in terms of the <laughs> ideas sorry, behind. I'm not being no, <laughs> I didn't mean in terms of conceptual art with a capital C. I meant with a small C in terms yes, of the I ideas like, yes, behind the space. Yes, I wasn't was meaning to. Um, no, no, it's all right. But, uh, I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> it just—it's a word that terrifies me. Oh, sorry. Because okay. I have absolute—I feel okay. I have absolutely no conceptual framework in my skull whatsoever <laughs> about how to think about 
Um, in fact, I don't have ideas. I'm only saying this because I think it's an important factor of how artists like I work, the way I work. Therefore, seeking a trigger that will get the process going, the process is incredibly important. And for me, it's often the banality of dimensions that if in the British Pavilion, that um, incredible first space you come into, the dimensions of that were incredibly important to being able to make that, for, whoops, sorry, <laughs> spatial awareness, <laughs> um, make that first room bust a gut and let the other work spill out of it. So they're not site specific, but they definitely use dimension as a key part for how the work can be initiated. Well, in certainly in Venice, the components, you know, they, they, might, they might go, some, maybe some of them might have been sold to separate, separate works, but they might go somewhere else. Mm. It was, but it, I still would, I'm going to pin you down a bit about this, actually, mm. because, okay, maybe I used the C word and I shouldn't have done. But what I did do was, I think, flag up that, yes, there are the physical dimensions of the Venice space. And I'm mm. sorry, some of you, if you haven't been to the Venice Pinale, it doesn't really matter so much because it was what it signified of being the choice to represent Great Britain at the Venice Biennale and the pavilion is this sort of lofty neoclassical rather snooty building at the mm -hmm. top of a little hill presiding in a rather imperialist way over the Giardini and all the other nations and I still feel that yes you do you do talk about the dimensions of that space and we'll talk about that a bit more but also it was about what it meant to be the British representative yes, yes, and this authoritarian yes. building mm -hmm. and there was quite a lot of debunking going on with you so mm -hmm. it was the idea behind the building mm -hmm. as well as its physical entity mm -hmm. I would take issue prodding yes you I think that. I think that grew out of these dimensions oh, okay. are extraordinary yeah. because they're higher the, the footprint of the space is not as great as the height of it and mm. also the circumnavigation around the space is quite dictatorial but also very very interesting for a sculptural experience you know that you're seeing the backs and the fronts of things as you go around the building and that seemed to me very much to be like being on stage and off stage, and hence beginning to break the space, stay, the, the space up with these big flat um, hoardings that the works would often be against or hanging off. So I was, in a way, the, the theatricality of the British Pavilion and its need to be the centre of attention in that, in that setup there um, did begin to intrigue me. And yes, that did become the idea it became the the thoughts that initiated, yes, I want to get very high, I want it to be incredibly full, I want it to be uncomfortable, and I want something to spill out, and for there to be an awkwardness about the work, and also maybe a kind of borrowing and stealing from the sort of theatricality of Venice itself, yeah. that everywhere you go you're greeted by a sort of flat facade of immense beauty and delicacy but incredible fragility and the whole thing seemed to be piling up these metaphors one on top of the other of a very fragile time and a, and a time of great change you know and I wanted in a way the work n not for the work to so much be about that but maybe that that was its associations. I mean, people talk a lot about anti-monumentality in your mm. work, the fact that it has this colossal scale. And I love the fact that you did send that great column in, in, the, in Venice and you filled, up, you filled up the space. And the same thing with the Juvenes as well, mm. another quite snooty grand processional space mm. that's very much about people moving through, through it exactly. and moving yeah. through. So there's a sense of kind of debunking the space again mm. and, and, and occupying it, but also about the sense of movement, I think, mm. and precariousness. So they've got this anti-monumentality, these enormous works that you make, you know, mm. often huge scale, but they either look like they're kind of on the brink of toppling a bit or something's a bit fragile, or indeed the materials, of course, can be paper in, in the sense of the juvenes mm. on the great column, great phallic column shapes. I remember you saying how much you love phallic forms and how awkward mm. it was during the heyday of feminism. Um, so we can do a sidebar on that. But also <laughs> the fact that you, know, you, you, you made these enormous towering forms all the way up to tickle the top of the mm. juvenes, but made of paper and gaffer tape, yes, cardboard and gaffer tape. Yeah, cardboard yeah. and gaffer tape. Yeah. So these anti-monumental materials. Mm. Tell me about this choice of these 
you've been doing this now for you know many decades mm. using these very chuck away i'll just materials. say one more thing about the audience which mm. sort of relates to this i mean yeah. i certainly with the tate and possibly to some extent with the ra show i'm sort of interested <coughs> in the idea of walking past things and walking around things and maybe that especially with the duveen works that they were works to be made to be walked past quickly yeah. because the Devine is a corridor through to the other parts of the Tate and I, I just thought of the way we travel and the way we catch glimpses of things out of <coughs> windows, train windows or bus windows or car windows and it, it seemed to me that how those memories of objects reside is quite important and how making work for the Devine might reside as a vague memory of somebody thinking, yes, I passed something then, but I don't know quite what it was. And that for me is, is enough. I, I very much like that idea that maybe there is work that doesn't have to be studied and dwelt upon. It can just leave a residual quality of its own. To be and about the experience. About the experience, exactly. And I think that materials in a way connect with that. I I do like to feel that if I've made something like the Tate column or even the canvas pieces in the RA at the moment, that the, the material has a certain expediency about it. It's not a special material. You know? <laughs> and if things go wrong with it, it can be very quickly replaced. And I think the two things oddly enough, go together, sort of looking quickly and making quickly. They're not, they don't necessarily mean that the experience isn't intense. Well, you've got to say one of your provocations here, I'm just looking at another one, saying sculpture must not show or tell its labour. Then underneath it says sculpture must be effortless. And of mm. course, in a way, both of that happens with your work. It's fantastically labour intensive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these enormous works, you work with many, many assistants, and I want to talk mm. a little bit more about that, but it has this fantastic, mm. these dynamic surfaces, the mm. materials you use, that they have the sense of, of coming into being, of the quick mm. gesture. And I think when you were talking to me about how, how you instruct your your assistants, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit, mm. because of course these are not all physically made by you, no. but they look as if they have been. The mm. smaller ones are, and there's this notion of the kind of authenticity of touch, because there is this swiftness, mm. this effortlessness, and there mm. also is the conundrum of it being an enormous Herculean labour, while at the same time looking as if they've all just been bundled together or thrown together. Mm. And that tension seems to be very important to you, mm. the touch, the personal, the impersonal, and also the sense that, you know, they came together and there isn't the blood, sweat and tears, mm. but they have this sort of vastness as well mm. in many respects. Yes, I think the, um, I, I mean, I think, okay, start at the other end of the question, you know, to send the work away to be fabricated. Um, I, I don't know, I think I've done it twice in the last 10 years where I've, with my studio manager, Adam, we've, we've, gone to fabricators and it's been a disaster not because of the fabricator just because the minute I've seen it I've said no I want to change my mind this isn't right and I think making it very much a studio activity is for me essential because that changing my mind is also very connected to not having this clear conceptual idea about the work the work does unravel itself and it needs to be followed. I have to follow it. Um, working with assistants, that of course becomes quite something for them if that process gets too elaborate. So I do at that point have to have instructions. Instructions have to be very clear and very simple, often comparing actions to something like the way a window cleaner cleans a window or the way a you know, broken paving slab gets mended, that the art bit Those is, are your instructions. Yes, that it's not an art thing, it's an expedient thing. So like I'll do the art thing in my own space with the, the smaller works, but for the assistants it's very much, this is a job, don't let art come into it, you know, because it starts a whole other set of processes that aren't 
I don't find are appropriate to the work. That's absolutely crucial, I think, mm. so that, you know, they do their bit to enable you to do your bit in yes, a way. Yes. And have to be very precisely told, mm. but it's using a different language. Which which brings me on to, to your to the language of your forms and the mm. language of your images. Mm. And you talk a lot in provocations here and also actually in, in, in interviews about the notion of invented form. Mm. And I think it's very interesting with, with, with your forms is that they're very they have many associations. We can look at them and make many associations in our mind, but they're not specifically anything. And mm. I think that's that seems to me to be important. Talk to me a little bit about how you evolve the notion of your form. I think they often have something to do with the action, the action of rolling or pushing or tearing or those kind of actions are often the ones that actually initiate the work. And then the surfaces are often following on from that. So um, I don't think the forms seem to emerge from the action, like crushing something. Um, you know, the forms will kind of come out of that action and be adjusted <coughs> and corrected according to that action as well. So, but there's also other qualities like things that can be seen through, you know, that have a portholes where the work on the other side can be seen or the space on the other side, as well as things that convey weight or absurdity like this work that was in the, <laughs> the tent, you know, means, yeah. or the quality of something fallen. Um, I think those, those um, actions or those uh, events of things breaking, falling, are, are very important to, to what the work actually becomes. An awareness of gravity really seems yes. to be. I mean, gravity is a material <laughs> that needs to be worked with. And if you're going to work against it, it then presents all these extraordinary technical problems of how you hold an object in mid, mid space. I mean, the actual notion of the forms, I mean, we're just seeing here, you know, everything from pom-poms to large sort of amorphous solid forms, mm. grids. I mean, it's an mm. infinitely various mm. vocabulary that you have. Of, Do you of think so? Well, you see, I, yeah. they, 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 I can see, I can, they, they loop back. Yes. You can repeat, they come yeah. back again in different forms, but they vary enormously in their nature and their language. And I'm just curious a little bit about, about the sort of inspiration. You've talked about the street, you've talked about surfaces. Mm. I remember you, you, you sp spoke brilliantly about, about the notion of um, looking at a wet street and it can look silver when the light hits it or it can mm. look black when it doesn't. This, these, mm. these, these are very important triggers to you in the real world. It seems to me they refer to the real world, the world around constantly, mm. this kind of filtering. Mm. I think um, the, the anthropological interest is quite important of what human beings leave behind themselves, the kind of evidence of their existence. And um, to me, the world around is full of that, things that have an ambiguity about what they are, you know, whether it's a, a strange kind of concrete area in the middle of a ploughed field, which is obviously where tractors park park themselves or what every farm equipment does or in the urban landscape you know numerous things that seem either coming into the world or going out of the world that ambiguity of not quite knowing whether something's half built or half mended or finished altogether or about to be constructed into something else I think this constant feeling of change um, I mean just in Leeds, coming through Leeds and seeing all the different things from when I was last here, whatever it was, six months ago, it just seems like the transformation of cities is just dramatic at the moment. But some of those transformations are in juxtapositions with things that you're, are precarious. You don't know whether they're, they'll be here next week. or, And I, I think that exchange is something I find incredibly inspirational. And in a way, I think there's a part of me that, that loves that aspect of sculpture, of not knowing when it's finished, you know, but maybe time or some other 
factor has to say, right, it's got to be finished. But there's a, always that uncertainty that it could have another layer on it. You know, nothing is, for me, completely conclusive in that respect. And of course, earlier on, before you before you started working with Hauser and Wirth, before you started getting gallery representation in, in, from 2010 mm. onwards, um, way before that, you were making your own sculptures with things that people left behind. There were things mm. that you left behind. Mm. I mean, the, the, the objects for were works both in the domestic environment, but also out on the street as well. Yes. Wedged between lampposts, put on bollards, <laughs> put on the street side. A photograph there, but but left to survive. Yes. You know? and I think that seems mm -hmm. what what motivated that. Why why did you? What, why was it important to do that? I think um, maybe begin with the practical side of you know the studio getting too full, not having any exhibitions or not having anywhere to put the work, and taking things into my own hands, and also very much wondering what the destination for artworks. <laughs> is or can be and what is the domestic space as a venue for artworks and what is the what is a public artwork you know if you put an object on the top of a grit bin in a on a road is it a very private object in a very public space you know i think these contradictions and anomalies are intriguing and are still open for debate, I think, you know, I think um, Walter de Maria's Kilometre Rod, where the original one was just this brass piece showing on the pavement in Documenta, yes. and now it's in its broken sections in the Dia Foundation. <coughs> I think that sort of exemplifies something about uh, a kind of public work becoming actually quite a private a private collection in a way, a pri private archive. I think, you know, where sculpture can be uncertain and in a way refuse to behave in, a, in its official capacity, I think it's when it's most powerful. And the idea of public and private mm. and also permanent and impermanent. I mean, you've done your first yeah. kind of permanent as much as anything is permanent in this world, um, piece for, for Jupiter Artland. Yes. Of course, actually, uh, just the, the piece the of, next one. Uh, yes, coming up mm -hmm. next one. Um, and in fact, I mean, this this work here is is, is oh. Oh, it's gone now. But but the Jupiter Artland, you know, the, the mm -hmm. a piece uh, it's into drawings. But anyway, mm -hmm. these are, these are permanent works for an outdoor context, mm -hmm. which are meant, you know, they're meant to be there for perpetuity. That's the first <coughs> time you've done that, isn't it? And is mm -hmm. there an interest? I mean, that's an interesting relationship to other works such as the piece we saw previously, which is on the High Line in, mm. in New York, which is there for a few months, mm. but it's not there mm. forever, but it's in the public realm. So you've got the sense of, of permanence now playing through. And of course, your work can be recycled, so sculptures will pop up in different incarnations from mm. having been in earlier installations that were perhaps it was originally conceived for a specific site. So this playing mm. between permanent, what is permanent, and sculptures popping up again seem mm. to be very much a part of, of what you do. And perhaps you yes. talk a little bit about making a permanent, a so-called permanent, at work for the first time because yeah, it's it was a very very concept. um i mean it was sort of challenging uh, <coughs> also mysterious you know the idea of making something that couldn't possibly retain its original characteristic you know something was going to happen to it whether mm. but the idea of working outside on this permanent work was um very revelatory you know working with the sky and the ground and with the the trees that were around it and you know trying to in a way bring something that was very much of now and they have a kind of industrial look about them the works that are there um, you know that was a sort of key to using that space again the space was the inspiration and the the way of walking through that wood and looking up made me think I want there to be a way in which we look up into the trees and that initiated making these two vast steel rings that were fabricated in Scotland mm. and um, that was where a fabrication was. I was going to say you, yeah. you, you were using a fabrication yes. at this point so that must yeah. have produced a whole realm of new challenges to have mm. that immediacy yes. that was still the touch. And very, 
it was very thrilling. You know, there was the work that had, <laughs> had otherwise been in several model forms. And then we made a timber and plywood version of it that the structural engineer took the measurements, etc., of it and went away and worked it out. And then used, um, for the first time for me, used digital programming to um, get the actual way in which it should be built because these were 12 meters up and 10 meters up these steel rings so it needed a structural engineer to advise and I've worked with structural engineers now three times and it's traumatic because <laughs> they, they want to do things like make things safe you know <laughs> <We're talking. laughs> I quite enjoy that thing in the studio where you know you can let something fall over we're talking, and, we're talking monumental here, though, with these, in a way, in, yes. in the old-fashioned sense of the term. So in mm. a way, you're sort of turning your own practice on its head by making something that is genuinely monumental, but trying to make it look like it isn't. Yes, way. yes, yeah, exactly. Or in the case of the Jupiter Artland work in Scotland, it was really working with, with the existing nature that was there and um, trying to find a way of making something have some compatibility with them. Yes, I don't know where the images have gone. <laughs> well, there's 200 of them coming yeah. through. Oh, yeah. But I, I, I think it's it's interesting to talk about also about, about your drawings a little bit, because you know, the, the, we, we've had some amazing wallfuls of drawings coming through on the images, and you mm. draw all the time. Tell me about the role of drawing in your work. How does it feed into the sculpture? Is it is it a parallel enterprise? Is, it's it, is the, it the starting point? What's the, what's the relationship? It's... Um, has so many different uh, ways of occupying me. I don't know whether drawings are going to become things or whether they will just remain as drawings. Um, but sometimes, quite often, I do loads and loads of drawings for particular works, yes. This was at um, Henry Moore Institute. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, and then during the making of the work, of course, I draw then as well, and I draw afterwards. So it's it's a continual process that goes on. I mean, what the role is, is really a kind of gathering of information and also an escape, and it's an escape from making, because you can make things, I can make things, do things in drawing that just wouldn't happen in the sculptural sense at all. So it, it fulfills a whole range of possibilities. You've called them bad copies of your experience of the outside world. Mm. What do you mean by well, that? Well, I think a lot of the work is are like kind of surrogates. They begin possibly with very clear references to objects, colour, anything that's I can get a catch a glimpse of and then the drawing of them is about the remembering of that it's not an accurate process and therefore it's about losing information as much as claiming information so what gets lost is things that just haven't been seen or haven't been remembered and I, I suppose I'm quite intrigued by that whole process of how you lose information, how it, how sculpture is all about losing information, <laughs> about the experience of being, being very transitory, despite all its solidity and all its being thereness, how you actually retain the experience of sculpture is quite complex, I think, how you remember what the back of the object you've just been looking at is whilst you're looking at the opposite end of it. That's, that's to me, such an ephemeral transitory experience compared with what its materiality might be. I think those paradoxes and con <coughs> contradictions in sculpture are an obsessive process for me. Mm. Really. And the sense of the sense, I mean, because I, I know you, another C word for you is, is, <laughs> is content. Oh, yeah. you know, the, sense, um, the sense that you don't want to have a specific sense of any kind of content 
even when people were talking about back to Venice Biennale again, the sense mm. of precariousness, the sense of you know, mm. the, the sense of the sense of all encompassing of of, mm. of, of making the, the the spectators seem overwhelmed by a dangerous environment in mm. a dangerous time. Mm. I could see the whites of your eyes slightly like when people talked in that respect. I mean, the notion of content is is is, is a vexed one for you. Is it, it seems. is it more the notion of subject that I'm. Mm. Um, sort of questioning yeah because I mean just as a sort of honesty thing I don't know what my subject is and right. I know I've said this loads of times that mm. I have to find I sort of know what the content is that it might be column like forms that okay. are very tall yeah. but what the subject of those columns ah, yes. are I'm, I'm unsure about I think the fact that precariousness does intrigue me and making things that assume this sort of formal structural status but have a precarious enough has has a lot of metaphorical associations which I'm intrigued by and um, I suppose that is in a way very connected to performance and theatricality as well but um, subject what I mean I sort of think the subject is embedded in the making you right. know and in the formal that the height and the tying the wrapping the spreading the spilling you know all those ways of making seem to me to be the subject of the work in some ways and even the accidents that happen the falling and the breaking <laughs> they 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 very much are Yes, the subject, I think. Because you said yeah. subject has itself become dominated by issues isn't it, in your provocations again. Mm. You know, the issues, a notion of subject in that respect, is, is it, I mean, is this problematic, do you feel? Gender, sexuality, ethnicity. If, if sculpture becomes too dominated by this, or subject becomes dominated by these issues, that can diminish rather than increase. I think if you don't have those issues, you're in a, in a, in a, maybe an awkward place. No, I think those issues are incredibly important. I just think there is another issue, which is when the circus moves on, what happens to those <coughs> issues? Do those Are those issues fads at the moment? And, you know, of interest to the art world, whatever the art world is, you know? Yeah. And do they provide incredible fodder to be written about and to be theorized about you know and to me that that is a problem of something the cart going before the horse you know you're you're you've got all the issues lined up and then you make the work <laughs> accordingly rather than i think you know that maybe the issues emerge because of the emotional or psychological influence that those issues might have on an artist or the art that they're making. I, I don't know, does that make any sense? No, it absolutely, it absolutely yes. does. It, 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 in a way, nobody... I mean, it'd be interesting to know what the audience think of that, actually, yeah. because it is such a current issue, and I, I'm not speaking offensively about it. I'm just saying that I think that, that once a work in... I mean, I don't want to bad mouth the artist, but a, a very distinguished Turkish video artist called Kulug Atman mm -hmm. did an incredible art angel project in the old post office up the end of Oxford Street. And he had something like 50 old television sets and ancient old armchairs and one bar electric um, heaters. But on each television set there was a homeless person from Istanbul who live in this area called Kuba mm -hmm. talking about their experiences of being a refugee and it was I found it absolutely shocking because I felt and I you know it'd be interesting to know what the audience think whether I'm just being a kind of self-righteous prig or something but I just found it excruciating because were those people still there mm -hmm. stuck mm -hmm. out in Istanbul. Here they were being a very sophisticated artwork, you know, praised by every critic and everyone, you know, but their lives were still continuing continuing as they were. And I don't know what, it maybe sounds very moral, but I don't know what the equation is. 
there. And you talk about morality quite a lot within, mm. within sculptural practice, and I'm I'm curious to know just a little bit about what you what you mean by that. You talk about you also talk about um, the sense of you know truth is a fallacy in art, and I'm curious to know what you mean by that, and whether the two have anything to do with each other. So the notion of truth, the notion of morality. Mm. You, you, you almost use you, you use <coughs> morality in a slightly pejorative sense, where you've talked about modernism to begin with. You, know, you didn't like the notion of, of the, the notion of, of morality of rights and wrongs, do's and don'ts yes. within a kind of yeah. modernist practice. Mm. Now I think you've, you've 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 changed your view somewhat towards some of the early people that you were not so not so um, not so complimentary about. Back I think in the it day, was just. But, um, my experience at the Slade, yeah, um, where there talk was, a little about that. Well, just sort of good work and bad began. work, yeah. you know, and, and beginning to think, well, why, why is this bad? Why is this wrong? <laughs> mm -hmm. And the language being very, very clear, and very, it did have a morality about it, and I think it was highly gendered and sexist. You know, I think girls did not make good work, they made bad work, you know, <laughs> they had to be taught a lesson. And that was, I think that was, for me, the sort of, despite the, the raging 60s, I think it was still very much about having a hierarchy where there was good at the top and bad at the bottom. And I think beginning to, for me, to begin to think about that turned me very much against British art. I, I began to dislike British art intensely because <laughs> I associated it with those those kind of judgments. And then looking, beginning to see images and extraordinary shows in London of Arte Povera, conceptual art, mm -hmm. um, pop art, you know, these collisions one after the other of those isms coming in and just blowing away those hierarchies, especially Arte Povera, I think, you know, where there was so much sense of ephemerality the, and the precariousness. Again. Yes, the transitory and things happening in off the cuff, you know, in in places that were not art spaces at all. And the huge impact of that and performance art as well. <coughs> I mean, the 70s, there's so much performance art went on that is there's no record of it you know? there's no documentation of it and that in itself is like rumor you know and, and, and also again quite epic epic i mean landau smithson yeah you're God, talking yes, about yes. Hamburg. Yes. talk a bit about matter matter clark, Gordon was, matter clark. Mm. was it the ambition of this work you know smithson's flow of <laughs> Pouring a great cascade yes, of absolutely. gravel in, over the edge of a over the edge into a quarry, or Matter mm. Clark carving up buildings. It's quite macho, though, all that you know yes, as well. Well, I like I like the macho, you know, and I don't think it's I don't think macho <laughs> is sexist, you know. I think I think some of these. Well, I like to challenge some of these words. I don't want to be boxed in um, as a female and not be allowed to go into territories that I do find fascinating. Like know. the phallic form you were talking yeah, about. Yes, earlier. exactly. And I think, um, yes, they were macho, they were. But because of that, they explored action in a way that was very radical. You know, the, the Matter Clark work where he's cutting up the um, wharf, New York wharf, is just an incredible action, you know, that completely defines a language, a sculptural language, in, in a way that maybe Tarkovsky does as well. So you get these kind of crossovers of the mysterious and the un, unhinged, the ambiguous, you know, all those things that are very restless, that take sculpture into languages that aren't just about the formal, or the aesthetic, they're about mood and atmosphere. You know, seeing a great gash in an industrial building that's being done by a guy that's sort of not even wearing a safety harness. You know, it, it's, it's, it's combined so many different spirits of adventure in it um, that I think are almost impossible to emulate now. You know. um, <coughs> But I think the sense of adventure too, when you when you actually encounter your sculpture. I mean, walking through the Royal Academy, 
it's interesting you've you've pared it back so you're not there's not such a mm. density of work yes yeah but you're having a completely dynamic encounter because you walk one way down or even you know with with, with works that are flashing up here too mm. they, they're not all the same from the same angle but with the royal academy it seems to be particularly yes. potent at the moment that you walk one way down those galleries and you have one exhibition you walk the other way it is completely different mm. but they're not so round they're not so packed you've got more freedom of movement mm. but your sight lines are still mixed up and this is a sort of sense of adventure to me it seems yes i i think um after after venice i had a complete revulsion to the um venice show um and i think there's a in the the venice pavilion is there and then you've got the german pavilion and the Canadian pavilion, then the French pavilion. And I, the German pavilion had this absolutely astonishing young, very young performance artist. And she's now showing at the Tate, actually, yeah. Anna, Anna Imhoff. Imhoff yeah. And her work was these glass tables that were like a stage that filled the entire German pavilion. Then she had naked performers sort of pressed in under the glass. I don't know if any of you saw it, actually, when you were... There, just absolutely, and then these Doberman dogs as well. The whole Roaming thing, around, yeah. yes, very. I mean, it was sort of quite in the tradition, I would say, of Joseph Boyce. You know, it had that legacy about it. But I was absolutely intrigued by it, and um, I realised that what was intriguing me was the fact that the audience went in were absolutely rooted to the spot. They were mesmerized by this incredible set of almost ritualistic events going on around them. But they were stationary. Meanwhile, this performance was deeply affecting to them. They could wait for it and allow it to happen. The same, in a way, in the Canadian pavilion with the water. Something happens. <laughs> and again, in the French pavilion where there were the recording <coughs> studios and it made me think well what the hell does this enormous amount of sculptural <laughs> objects that don't do anything and um is that is that dull is that is that not offering anything but it did make me think but that your sculpture just your sculpture made us move your yes, sculpture well forces that, us to that move that was what i then began to think about was that sculpture if there is such a thing of sculpture, I back to our the first publication, <laughs> <laughs> um, it is not passive. It, you, as a viewer, have to be extremely active to get anything back from sculpture. And I saw this as a kind of wonderful escape clause out of the sort of feeling that I couldn't look at the Venice work. That was the end of the road for me. I. I'd done as much as I could with filling spaces in that way. And it began this sort of return journey for me of beginning to look at sculpture as an autonomous object again, where the space, its relationship to space, would be much more expansive, where the battle between space and the object would be much more mutual rather than, in a way, the space being squeezed almost out of itself. And um, so in that, in that sense, that whole experience of Venice, although for a time was quite difficult to overcome in a way, it's actually become a very enlightened experience just because it's triggered a, comp a new way of working, a new way of looking back at the sculpture that I was so busy rejecting um, from the 50s and earlier, the 40s, you know. I mean, prop on the high line, the piece mm. that we saw with the two holes in, mm. the two large holes, in a way has a huge amount to do with, you know, Hepworth, Moore, mm. the whole negative space. So totally, yes. so are you yeah. now, you, you are really re-embracing these, these oldsters that you so, Definitely, that you yes. so vigorously rejected? I've got these um, three books that I got way back in about 1963, and they're like the sort of hideous books of sculpture, you know, every kind of sculpture that you would love to hate is in those books, you know. But what, I, what sort of sculptures would... Well, I mean, I think... <laughs> what sort of sculptures do you love to hate? Come on. Um, uh, well, I, 
you know, Zad Keen, I don't know. Ossip and then Ossip Zad Keen, yeah. um, Henri Lorenz. Uh, there are so many. I mean, I love Fautrier. Uh, he's slightly different. There's de Buffet sculptures. I mean, these are all... There's also French people like Starley, Etienne Martin. I don't know if anyone's heard of yeah, these sort people. sort of wobbling between abstraction and figuration. Well, really and kind of, heavily yes. crafted, yes. great big, ugly, rolling forms. Um, Angst-ridden post-war, you know. I mean, Zadkin's um, work that is in, uh, you know, the monument for the war that's in Rotterdam, you know, an extraordinary work. Yes, they're all male, except for people like Germain Richier and, um, well, Louise Nevelson. But, I mean, those those artists I see, I've always loved and will never not love, no, no, you yeah. know, but because they were doing very different things with that kind of modernist formalism, in my opinion. You know. But um, yes, no, I've been looking at them again and becoming very intrigued. I wouldn't say that I want to emulate them in any way, but I'm intrigued by the sheer guts of those forms and that language, you know, that it's uncompromising in its kind of fearlessness to be in a way, ugly, you know, and what, at what point does the ugly actually become extremely beautiful? There's an edge there, again, a bit like perilous form, you know, where something starts to happen that, yeah. And colour is another thing that we haven't discussed, and mm. I think it's, it's so crucial, because looking at, I mean, looking at the, the, the canvas works in your, in your, recent show look at the great zinging colours that come out here, the pinks, the oranges, then the greys, and they go, mm. it goes anti-colour, it goes obdurately anti-colour, mm. but colour seems absolutely crucial. I was looking, I'm, in, in your current Academy show, the, the, the threshold piece where you've got the, the bolts, mm. each, each rivet <laughs> bolt has been almost like it's an emergent, it's like it's signage, it's mm. been spray painted, a different cerise mm. pink, yellow. Mm. Blue, these these highlighting. So color seems absolutely crucial as part of this kind of response, as part of, of heightening the experience. Is that or what? What is your use of color? I think it's with? it's it began very much as uh, looking at color on the streets and the fact that there are so many marks, uh, the way pavements get marked or scaffolding poles get marked often very in very pretty colors and how a lot of signage on the street is seems to be about seeking attention and i like that expedience and that's sort of in a way what i borrowed in terms of the the colors i use that they're attention seeking <laughs> they're there to make something more conspicuous um, but they're also quite basic in what they are as colours, um, very much taken from from the street, from the urban environment. But filtered again, filtered by you, filtered, mm. but, but to signal. Mm. And just, but, but, all, but it seems that it, in the past there was dense painting, you, you, you created the colour on the surfaces or very densely within, within even with these works, it was like a, a mixture of a palette. Mm. It seems it's sort of simplified to an extent. It's the well, materials themselves the... signaling the colour now, mm. rather than you applying or mixing or having so much hands. It's, it's a lighter touch, But possibly. I think the colour, like these arches, the colour was often there to mark where more action needed to happen. And, and so those colours would get covered over with cement or mm. scrim and cement. But then I quite like that filtration through of the colours, that sort of palimpsest set of mark making, really, and started to, one could say, almost affect it, you know, to make it become part of the, the way the work would find its resolution. So I took something that was initially a very expedient thing, a way of saying that, yes, I need to go over this again, and then actually making that become the finished surface. But with the the works, later works since the Venice Biennale, it's really been saying, I, I don't need the colour, you know, I want to let go of that and see where it becomes a necessity, um, rather than it just becoming a mannerism that gets 
put on at the end of the work. I, I wanted to not get into that position where something had to have colour, um, because that was the way I work. I wanted it to have colour because it's performing some kind of necessity in a way. Or signalling. Signalling. Yes, something. that's a good way of putting it actually. Communicating. Yeah. Mm. And so where do you see your work progressing? I mean, obviously that's crystal ball time and, uh, until you get a specific, but you've, you've got work, mm. shows coming up, work coming up. Is it again inspecting each space, each, each particular context? Now these next few shows aren't, they're going to be actually something that I don't do very much, which is using works that I already have and then mixing them up with other works. <coughs> so that's where the, the, the non-site specific element of the work will really come into its own. <laughs> and this is a new departure? Yes. Is it not? Yes. And what's yes. motivated that? Um, not wanting to make any more stuff to put in the world? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's very I good stuff that you do put in the world. <laughs> I think just the opportunity to see how some of the, I mean, the next show in LA will actually have two new pieces and one remake, which um, is, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that idea of remaking a work. I think, um, because it can't possibly be the same. And then in the next show in, in Germany, I will actually make remake a work from the 1970s. So to me, this is like a, a journey of discovery because in a way my past relationship with my work is that it just disappears you know <laughs> and it's interesting having a show in London because I have the agony of having to go and look at it <laughs> and think oh god you know why did I do that yeah <laughs> whereas before because they're elsewhere and uh, I just go away and in a way don't have much of, of a relationship with it. Once once the show is up, it's like, bye, you're on your own now. You, you can go and do drugs and sex as much as you like. <laughs> I'm no idea to stop, you know. It is, it is like saying goodbye to something. But is know? that not to an extent taking things full circle to when you first put things on the street and went, bye, you're propped up on a bollard now, you're stuck between a lamppost, you know, this is your work, my yes, work's out yes, there, and I'm yeah, now leaving yeah. you. Yes, it's a sort of, for me, it was a kind of defiance about preciousness, you know, that, that these things were in the moment of making incredibly important, and some of them would take time, but in the moment of saying, getting rid of them, really, it was like being very ruthless, you know, and saying, I, I, you know, these either go to the local skip, and our local dump actually is the center of the new Arsenal ground. And I, I always think the Emirates Stadium has underneath it a complete retrospective. <laughs> if you wanted, anyone wanted to go and excavate it, you'd find 20 years of work under there. And I got to know the guy. This was before waste became so regimented. I got to know the guy really well. And I said, what, what? What is it that you do? <laughs> well, it's always so, been a point of cross-dressing with what's in a skip. Yes. Well, yes. To, to an extent, yeah. I guess, but in a mm. way. Before I throw it open to questions from, from mm. the audience, I just wanted to, you talked about your journey, and I think you know, your circumstances have changed dramatically. So, you know, you were teaching mm. for three decades, teaching as a professor at the Slade, and I mean, mm. there's been endless talk about, you know, the artists that you worked with and the people, the people that you, you worked with, and I wanted to talk not, not about Just that. Martin Creed has said, I was the best artist who never taught him. So <laughs> I think Tassadar Dean would say the same. I think I, this sort of thing that's rolled out is... Um, <laughs> but, but I wanted to talk tedious. not about you teaching the artist, but more about the effect that teaching perhaps had on your work. And now that you're, you know, you're not teaching, you, you've not been teaching now for a decade, but you are represented by House and Earth, one of the, you know, the world's great, great galleries who can... You know, help you to do whatever you want to do. Really, mm. how has that played out in your work, if at all? Has it had a direct impact on your work, the teaching bit, mm. and then and then the, the the expediency of that? And now, of course, a very different set of circumstances. Yeah, I think teaching is very influential. I mean, I think for me, the most enjoyable aspect of teaching was often 
having the privilege to talk to students who didn't know what to do, you know, who were stuck. And because I've experienced that, it was it was being able to share that with them and say it's actually one of the best places to be, you know, because, you know, getting unstuck means real courage and taking all sorts of risks that you, you're not allowing yourself to do. <laughs> and um, I suppose that mantra was the thing that I very much took into the studio. You know, the, there weren't necessarily exhibitions lined up. But my urge to make work never never went away. And yes, throughout my teaching, I, I did also have exhibitions, but there was a, a decade, possibly from 1983 till about 1993, where it was, you know, um, it, the, there just was nothing happening. And I think it's a, it's a really challenging time for an artist that. But it doesn't mean to say that artist isn't still working. And I, I think we live in this sort of success-driven culture yeah. where being visible means <coughs> you're alive as an artist. And if you're not visible, then you're sort of dead as an artist. I find it quite shocking and extremely, well, it's, it's, not, it's not what is actually happening. You know, artists are working under the most extraordinary circumstances, as you you know, you know, and for a visible, a, a medium that's meant to be visible, it's ast astonishing that, you know, most art that's produced isn't seen, yeah. you know, and, and in a way that's a sort of glorious piece of heroism, really, I think. <laughs> but you're now supported by the by you're part of the art market you know you you, you make works that your works sell your works you, you know you're remaking works maybe works that have previously been sold or maybe they disappeared but who knows but, but there's a sense of, 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 the, of the of the the market now being part of your existence and how do you feel about that I mean what what is that what difference has that made to you beyond being able to pay the bills which helps well I think that's the first thing isn't yeah. it when when I gave up teaching uh, my husband and I we put the house on the market and then two months later, <laughs> I met um, Ivan and Manuela from Hauser and Worth, and we took the house off the market. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. it is that that simple. If you want that that aspect of the story, and then and then since then, it's it's yes, it fascinates me what does sell and what doesn't sell, and you know what do I then do to do about that? You know. Do I respond to that? Do I ignore it? Um, those are big issues, you know. The fact is the, the large work doesn't sell. And to me, that is an interesting form of the radical side of sculpture, yeah. you know. That if it's, if it's large, it's uncomfortable and awkward and there's nowhere for it to go. So it, it occupies, in a way, quite a contentious place. But a small, bright, coloured thing, you know, yes, that will sell. And that then means making more work. So what I message would know. you have to a young artist now? I mean, it's, it is, as you say, quite famously, very difficult for, I mean, we all know, incredibly difficult for artists now. The whole, mm. the, the, the fee structures and the way that art schools are run now is very different to how it was in, in, the, in the earlier mm. days. And, and the sense, too, of being able to find a place to work for a studio, to be supported. Also, as you say, that the idea that to, to be a practising artist, you have to have gallery representation and be shown and be having mm. exhibitions to, mm. to be have credibility as an artist. Mm. So what, what advice would you give? What would you, what would you say within this, within this? Anarchy, you know, I think, um, no, I feel, I feel quite strongly about this and it might be quite offensive, but I think it's the new generations of artists, you know, they're up against a formidable situation with big, big galleries at the top, not much in the middle, and then small, smaller galleries that come and go. And in a way, filling that middle gap is an open opportunity to emerging artists just leaving <coughs> art schools and just to keep going it doesn't matter if it's one drawing a week just hang in there and trust who you are you know and uh, 
Yes, keep going. I, what can I say? You know? <laughs> I think that sounds like very sound advice. So I think now let's let's keep going with some questions uh, from from the audience. Um, shout away. I'm interested to know a bit more about your relationship with your studio assistants uh, and how you actually see them. Are they students, apprentices? Um, they're ex, mostly ex students. Not from, not necessarily from the Slade or from from art schools, and a lot um, happens on one one um, assistant who might be leaving will then recommend someone they know, and it's like a chain <coughs> reaction. <laughs> I was trying to get at what your philosophical relationship with them is, and how you see them. Are they simply there to carry out your commands? No, no, you they're there to, to engage in a discussion with how the work is, how I want the work to be, and what is the best way that they can understand those instructions, and can they, are there any comments they want to make about that? You know, would it be better to do it this way or that way? Shall we try both ways, et cetera, et cetera? So, because they're art student, have been art students and are now artists themselves, they often have very good suggestions to make, which is important to respond to. And so it is It is a collaboration at that point. Does that answer your question? Um, well, sort of. Um, I'm always interested to know how artists with large studios and many employees actually credit the people who are helping them create the art. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. Very well-known artists. Yeah. yeah, well, I always thank them in the in the blurbs about the exhibition. If, but I, yeah, no, I think it's a very close relationship. It's not <coughs> one where I abandon them and go and do something else. I'm very much in the studio with them um, during the process. Uh, and yes, a, a, a relationship does build up between me and them. But not, I, I notice over the years that people don't want to remain assistants for more than a certain amount of time. So the turnover can be quite quick. And then, then it's getting used to new people as they come in. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Um, thank you for sharing um, so much insight um, about your practice. I'm just wondering what you, given what you said about um, how you will work, uh, how you sort of terrified of that first encounter, you're not thinking about audiences and, and how that first encounter with the work is also something that is, is the site of meaning making in a sense for you. Um, how do you feel about what's being written about your work and how your work's interpreted? And is that sort of a realm that you don't want to engage with or, or what's your relationship to it? Um, sometimes quite problematic because I think in order to write, um, to write about an encounter which is sentient, you know, it's about the senses, I think is incredibly difficult and to give that critical clout, it seems to be a very difficult language to enable. Um, I think if it's, if there is a sort of semiotic way of writing about art, it's, dare I say it, I think it's easier because you can attach these multiple meanings and unravel them according to your preferred theory, whether that's psychological or deconstructive or whatever it is. But I think, um, you know, when the work occupies a, a, a more emotive territory, I think it becomes very, very difficult to put language to that. And then, you know, the as Louisa was mentioning, this idea of the simile, where you're likening it to something, you're saying it's like this, it's like that, sort of closes, closes down the way in which it can be talked about. So I think it's, there are, there are issues with that, yes, the, the difficulty. <laughs> Anybody else? 
Oh, just one quick one here. Mm. Well, I think we have to wind up. Right when you were talking about what your subject might be, and um, you see, what, my response is that it's about this relationship between mind and material. Mm. Mm. And I'm fascinated by how material can carry mind or feel yes. or, or thoughts. Mm. And um, it's a really rich territory in sculpture. But when I'm looking, at your work, I mean, it's such an intriguing problem, the relationship between the material of the brain and mind, or the fact that material on this planet, through various <coughs> reasons, gravity, etc., accident and structure, it evolved into producing life and, and mind. And I, I wonder whether this relationship between material and mind is your subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's an amazing statement. Um, I sometimes feel as though I'm quite blind in a way and that maybe I'm not that interested in materials. I'm interested in the job that they can do. And because something like clay, which was material I was so attracted to years ago, I think everything comes out of clay as um, a material that will respond to anything you do to it absolutely immediately. <laughs> and I think I'm always trying to get back to that and because I do like large objects. I like the confrontation with a large object and the experience of the two physicalities, mine and it, you know, in, in some kind of exchange, that clay was no longer viable after a certain point or after a certain size. It became riddled with complexities. So I changed to other materials, like materials that could be crushed, like paper and fabric, as a sort of substitute for that. But it wasn't th because I loved paper and fabric. It's because they would do certain things. So yes, maybe there is a sort of mental or psychological kind of urge to make materials do things um, that is is probably a mental issue in some way, if I'm, if I'm responding to your question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's a fascinating answer. Thank you so much, Philida, and thank you for sharing so generously all your Thank Amazing you. insights. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to finish off with uh, a couple of recommendations. Um, we did see uh, slides of Philida's current Royal Academy show, which is very new. It's, it's only just open. Um, I saw it yesterday, and it's a fabulous, fabulous exhibition. So if you do um, get down to London in the next few months, please try to see it. But if you don't, um, I'd also like to tell you the good news that imminently um, an exhibition of Philida's work will be opening in Leeds Art Gallery, drawn from uh, the collection and supplemented by two fantastic new acquisitions. One. A, a, a very unusual early work to be represented in public collections in this country, I think, and supplemented by a work related to the, um, the Venice Biennale exhibition. So uh, we're very lucky to have that work in, in the city, and it will be here during the, um, the Yorkshire Sculpture International. Um, but anyway, enough of that. I would just like you all to join me one, one more time in thanking Louisa and Philip. <laughs>